Okay, let's resume this session. Um, it would be wonderful if the people coming in could sit near the front. That's always nice. Thank you. You come forward a bit, that'd be great. As we said, the business class seats are at the front. Okay, um, well, I have the pleasure in this session to hand over chairing to my colleague, uh, uh, Frank, Frank Wijbum, from the uh, who's the CEO of the CJR. And he will introduce our highly distinguished guests. Um, but let me just first say that Frank is the, uh, uh, is, uh, the obvious, as I said, the CEO of the CJR, which is a huge consortium, well known to everyone here. Um, does so much valuable work um, from the 15 CJR research centers. And he may say a bit more about that. Um, but Frank also has a long and distinguished career in, 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 in many uh, key organizations. He was the director of water sanitation and hygiene and global development at the Gates Foundation. Uh, was the director of programs at google.org um, and the director general of the International Water Management Institute. So over to you, Frank. Well, this is an exciting panel uh, because, uh, of course, uh, we're actually quite pleased with ourselves in agriculture that after many years of knocking on the door, there seems to be some difference uh, in the dynamic uh, Agriculture seems to be sort of breaking through. And uh, a key fact is not so much that uh, agriculture is at the heart of the negotiations, but that in the INDCs, uh, agriculture shows up much more than we had expected. We've been talking about that. And uh, of course, then people say, well, but then it's interesting to know what that will actually mean. What will it mean for specific countries? What will it mean for other stakeholders? Where will be the climate finance? So here we have a number of people on the podium who can tell us more about what this means for their own organizations, what their <laughs> commitments are, and particularly, of course, how we look at the links between these commitments uh, and food security uh, and agriculture more generally. Now, the CGIR, to start this off, I mean, this morning, uh, my colleague Tony Simon says, you know, we should not just have INDCs, but you puts, which was a long acronym that meant put your own house in order before you look to others. So we should all make personal commitments in addition to countries. And indeed, the CGIR analyzed earlier this year that as much as what we thought of about 60% of all the work of the CGIR directly contributes to climate smarter or climate compatible agriculture. And we were also very pleased earlier this week to be uh, a partner with the French government in a new initiative, Cat pour Mille, to try and focus on the soil's enormous capacity to sequester carbon, uh, which we think of as a, a triple win, uh, mitigating potentially uh, significant greenhouse gas uh, emissions or the equivalent of, uh, but at the same time, improving food security and agroecological functioning. So looking for such triple wins is a major uh, opportunity, we feel. Uh, we are in the middle of uh, trying to get accredited with the GCF and we have prepared a proposal with seven countries to try and scale up and out uh, climate smart agriculture with a focus on uh, soil carbon in those seven countries. So that is, if you like, a key contribution uh, that we are uh, hoping to make. Now, we are not a country, uh, but we uh, hope, therefore, to be working very closely with countries to support them in their INDCs. So with that little introduction, and having given you time to be ready for these kind of <laughs> commitments, we hope that you can explain from your sides. Can we first uh, give the floor to the president of Palau, the eighth president of the Republic, and the first Palauan to be elected as president three times. So, sir, you have uh, uh, a number of roles in the international arena. Uh, you're a champion of the Earth Award, for example, and you've had visionary leadership in this area. So we're looking forward to how you see uh, you know, agriculture and food security play a role in your country's commitment. Well, thank you, Frank, for uh, that uh, kind introduction. And first of all, uh, it, it, it's good to be here, uh, especially for Paris. I, I'm like a fisherman out of the water, uh, or like a fish out of the water. 
I, I hope to go back home and have good news uh, to tell uh, our people. Uh, because our, our food security is indeed uh, uh, largely based on the ocean. So when, when we talk about the impact of climate change, uh, we have to put a face uh, on the people who depend their livelihood on what happens to the ocean. So for me, the, the biggest uh, thing about food security is uh, really the ocean. And, and that's why we hope that uh, out, of, uh, out of the discussions here in Paris, uh, out of the NDCs that we have to, uh, the targets that we have to set forward, that we do also in the context of what we need to do to protect uh, the ocean. Agriculture, farmlands, uh, and uh, small island nations like Palau are threatened, uh, if not already very much affected, by sea level rise. So all are the all our ac agricultural uh, farmlands on the coastlines uh, um, are already uh, destroyed. And our farmers now have to move inland in higher grounds. The thing with higher grounds is that Oftentimes, the soil is not fertile. So we do need to, to make that soil uh, prime for uh, agriculture production. That is one uh, challenge. Other challenge that I wish to note here is that because of the, uh, the global um, interconnectivity, uh, we're having our share of uh, invasive species, Frank. Uh, fruit flies, uh, which we did not traditionally have on the islands now, are also affecting our farmers. So uh, fruit production is very much affected and uh, agricultural production is affected. So that's a partnership also that I, I would hope, uh, um, you know, the private uh, partners and other public partners and uh, uh, assistance can also be uh, uh, allocated to that uh, side. But uh, the other uh, area that I would like to emphasize on is the, um, um, the aquaculture uh, component of food security. Uh, you may think we come from large ocean states and so that fish are abundant. But really, just in my lifetime, uh, food abund uh, fish abundance and sizes have also dwindled to the point now where we need to have aquaculture uh, really to support the livelihoods of our people. Palau is very happy to be a leader in clam, giant clam uh, farming. Uh, we're also a leader in uh, milk fish and rabbit fish uh, production. So we're expanding on that uh, uh, partnerships with our farmers. Uh, it is, uh, however, a costly uh, undertaking so we partnered with uh, Japan and also uh, the Republic of China, Taiwan, to build our <coughs> research and, uh, more and uh, seedling uh, facilities. But the, the outcome and the output of those uh, uh, investments have uh, proven very profoundly successful. And uh, we need to take expand that kind of uh, initiatives throughout the Pacific Islands. I think the lesson to be learned is that no longer can we just rely on harvesting from the wild. Uh, that is not sustainable. We need to increase production by human inter, uh, uh, initiative uh, on aquaculture. Um, farming, uh, of course, uh, uh, we are very proud to say that taro is our subsistence food, but it's also our export food now. Uh, but diseases have also affected the uh, taro. But I like to say that we have found and identified a species of taro that even our friends from Samoa came to Palau to, be, to, to take it back home because it's uh, disease resistance and able to withstand salt water uh, penetration. So these are the kind of uh, things that we need and I thank you for this opportunity. That's a very uh, clear uh, if you like, expose of the issues that you face. Uh, 
In your INDC, in, in your commitments, do you see specific actions that the government will undertake or specific needs for climate finance or technical assistance that you expect uh, uh, to be a priority uh, to address these issues? Yes, in the we are very low emitters to begin with. I think uh, the, st the, the statistics would show that uh, the Pacific Islands uh, are probably 1% of the emission uh, in the entire world, and uh, but we are affected by 99% of what the world does. Uh, we are pers we we have no practical target but to go through renewable energy. Uh, after all, we have we're a tropical climate, sunshine all year round. We have wind. We have uh, ocean current uh, uh, opportunities. We got uh, hydro uh, waterfall opportunities, and even OTEC ocean thermal energy conversion. So all these possibilities are there on the islands. These uh, technologies, unfortunately, are very expensive to start with. But I think uh, with the right uh, partnership, the right commitment, and the right investment, in the long run, we're able to become uh, uh, really energy efficient and uh, also uh, be a leader in the INDCs. Thank you, sir. Well, yes, you took the question as your commitments on, on mitigation, and I think we'd all agree that uh, it's not Palau that has contributed to uh, the issue mostly. But I would expect also that countries like your own will set targets on adaptation as well, on specific things that uh, you will do in years to come to make sure that you can have a, resist a resilient uh, food security system for, for your country. Um, but thank you for sharing your thoughts. Can I uh, move then to uh, your neighbor, to John Bryant, who has worked with Kellogg since 1998 in different roles of the company. You're now the president and CEO, uh, decision maker, obviously, uh, but also a leader. Earlier this week, uh, we heard, uh, we think, impressive announcement from the World Business Council for Sustainability, uh, for Sustainable Development on uh, your low carbon uh, initiative. And we know that Kellogg is a, a leader in that initiative. Uh, so we're looking forward to, to hearing from you how you see the role of uh, the company, but also you're here the a representative of the private sector, so f feel free to uh, make remarks that go beyond uh, Kellogg alone. Can we give you the floor? Thank, thank you, Frank. Well, thank you, CGIAR and CCAS, for uh, this opportunity to be here today. It's an honor to represent the Kellogg company, and it sounds like the entire private sector as well. Um, sustainability, uh, climate change, critical issue for the Kellogg Company. And there are three different reasons why it's a critical issue for us and why we're addressing it. One, it's core to our values, it's in our DNA. Secondly, consumers absolutely care. Consumers expect companies like Kellogg to take on action, and take the change. And third, as a major agricultural company, the ability to source grains around the world is coming under risk if we don't act. First, it's in our DNA. There was actually Mr. Kellogg over 100 years ago who started the company. He was one of the great philanthropists and conservationists of his generation. He gave away virtually all of his wealth, which created the Kellogg Foundation. The Kellogg Foundation today is one of the largest charities in the world, gives away about $400 million a year, children's education, health care, and is the largest shareholder of the Kellogg Company, and over half the assets of that foundation are shares in the Kellogg Company. So the DNA of the company is impacted by the beliefs of its founders, which is still very much alive and well today. But secondly, consumers absolutely care about sustainability. They care about the environment. They want to know where their food comes from, what's done to it, and how do I, how do I ensure it's being grown in a responsible way? And with the rise of digital, mobile, social, all these new media out there, the voice of the consumer today is louder than any time in history, and it's only going to become louder as we go forward. So the consumer is becoming a driving force. They expect demand companies like Kellogg to take the actions that we're taking uh, in, in our system. And then finally, the very uh, fragility of the supply chain worries me. All it takes is a series of droughts around the world and the ability to get some of these key grains becomes at risk. We've already seen it once. 
back in 2008 when Egypt closed its borders for the transfer of rice out of Egypt. And that was our primary source of rice for, for Europe. So this is a very fragile supply chain. And at the same time, we need 70% more food by 2050 to, to feed a growing population. So we must change our practices significantly. So what are we doing as a company? We have all of the initiatives that you expect a company like Kellogg to have within the four walls of our plants, greenhouse gas emissions, water, waste, et cetera. But we have to take responsibility for the entire end-to-end -end supply chain, from the farm all the way to the breakfast table. When you look at the carbon footprint of a company like ours, it's primarily back on the farm and partially within our processing facilities. So we're working to get back on the farm. So we have a commitment to help half a million farmers take on climate smart agricultural practices. As we think about those practices, they do a couple of things. Firstly, they improve the livelihoods of those farmers. If you look at where the people who have the greatest, I guess, uh, poverty issues, it's often people working back on the farms. Secondly, it can improve the yield of those farms and reduce the impact on the environment in those farms. So a couple of examples. We have a program called Lights On in Bolivia. We purchase a grain called quinoa. Quinoa is a relatively new grain into the, in the food industry. So we, we sent people down to Bolivia to work with farmers to improve the yield, reduce the impact on the environment, to ensure that they were following sustainable practices and provide access to solar panels, et cetera, so they could have access to electricity, which then helped them from a whole, whole range of ways. One, their kids could obviously study at night, but also they could get access to world prices for quinoa to make sure they're getting good prices and, and achieving the objectives they're looking for. Another one would be rice. We are a large purchaser of rice around the world. We use it in rice bubbles, rice crispy treats, et cetera. A number of things that we're doing to improve the impact of rice. We're working with, with Erie on helping uh, farmers move from wet rice production to dry rice, dry rice production, which obviously reduces the methane gas emissions of that approach. We're working with farmers, with rice farmers in Louisiana, in Thailand, on a variety of initiatives. In Thailand, for example, to introduce a medium grain rice to help biodiversity and soil health. So a number of, of factors we have going on there. These programs are both in the developing world as well as in the developed world. So we work with wheat growers in the UK, wheat growers in the Saginaw Bay watershed in the US around Michigan to reduce their impact on the environment. So it is a full end-to-end -end supply chain commitment. We have mapped out carbon across that, that entire footprint and what we can do to make a difference. So we're absolutely committed to it. I'm excited to be here today uh, because I think working in isolation, we can do so much. Working in partnership with governments and other companies, we can do so much more. Thank you. Thank you. And I was pleased to hear you speak uh, about not only making your own operations carbon neutral. I mean, there have been a number of companies making those announcements. And that's a great step, but also working with your supply chains to make them carbon neutral. Now, carbon neutral is one thing. Do you also see yourself play a role in making those supply chain more resilient, in making those, uh, particularly the resource poor farmers, adapt to uh, climate change? Yes. I mean, I think there's a couple of elements in there. Firstly, um, you know, it's, it's one thing to, world, to feed the world's population in an average year. But unfortunately, not every year is an average year. So we actually have to have a system that is strong enough that if you get a couple of droughts in key growing regions, you can sustain through that environment. We recognize that uh, as we work with these farms, a big part of this is to improve the livelihoods of the farmers. And that's the best way to ensure uh, a sustainable model. Because the model has to be sustainable both from an environmental perspective and also an economic perspective for the farmers. But also in the situation where we have a shock, and it doesn't work out, we, you know, the system doesn't work as well as we would hope. We also recognize as a food company, we have an opportunity to step in and also deal with hunger issues that come out of those sorts of events. So we have a program called Breakfast for Better Days. We give away a billion servings of food by 2016. We've actually done that, achieved that goal in half the time. So as a company, we're both, we're doing two things. One, trying to improve the sustainability uh, and the, uh, the strength of the supply chain. And then secondly, also providing a safety net in situations where, that's, where that supply chain does break down. Great, thanks. So indeed, the kind of commitments that we need is to make, in the end, in the end hundreds of millions of smallholder farmers both
resilient to climate change and work to have a low carbon uh, agri-food system. Sounds like we're making some steps in the right direction. I'm sure that people here are eager to, hear, to hear about those and of course hold you accountable to see what happens with them. Now, can we move on then uh, to Dr. Noke Ishi, the CEO and uh, chairperson of the GEF. Now, you are, uh, of course, the primary environmental finance uh, uh, function, and you're taking on part of the climate finance uh, as well. We know that you've been uh, a partner with IFAD in uh, adapting smallholder farmers, and we're very interested to hear from you, uh, both from your former perspective as a finance minister and uh, as uh, an international uh, expert, if you like, how you see the role of GEF uh, particular, but climate finance in general for, for this emerging uh, priority on agriculture and food security. Please. Thank you so much, and I'm really um, pleased to be here. Let me um, start by congratulating uh, all of the attendants or participants today, because as I um, understand from everybody, uh, back in a few years ago, it has been very difficult to even have a meaningful conversation with the agriculture within the context of climate change. Now this agenda has been moving to the central stage of climate discussion, so I, I think it's a significant sea change I have observed, and I think that you should be um, getting a credit uh, of this huge achievement, and uh, particularly CGIAR, your leadership, and everybody, so that uh, I think it's really, really great achievement, and actually it's good for the world. So congratulations for everybody for your real hard, hard work. Um, but at the same time, it's not necessarily in coincidence that the world has recognized this importance of agriculture within the broader context. I actually want to also mention this SDG, which is adopted three months ago in Septem uh, September in New York. The SDG clearly recognized that the, uh, the food security issue as a part of this uh, 17 goals. And uh, the one thing which is very good at the SDG is uh, they also recognized very clearly that uh, there is a planetary boundary uh, in this world and uh, we need to find a way to still continue to uh, strive or to develop or prosper within that planetary boundaries. As already mentioned by my previous speaker, we are facing the huge challenge of growing population to nine to 10 billion, additional three uh, million of uh, middle class then urbanization. So we need to find a way to still, you know, feed those growing population without undermining the very basis of our future planet, which is ecosystem. Well, so can can we actually that uh, transform our system to, you know, meet that end? I think there are three important key systems we need to see or we need to transform. One, obviously, energy system, no doubt about it. Second how to deal with urbanization. So city system, how we live is very important. But third important key economic system we need to transform is how to produce food. So we are here discussing that and this tremendous and daunting challenge of how we can transform the food production sector without undermining our own future. And still, you know, we need to give an, uh, the, the very good and, uh, uh, food to, to everybody. So that's the challenge we are facing. And that's why that then, you know, the world started to recognize everything is interconnected. And that's why we need to, you know, have this SDG. We want to have this agriculture as a part of this uh, climate change uh, uh, agreement. So in a sense, there is no coincidence and we have been seeing this huge achievement you have you have made. Agriculture, now we want to discuss, but as an important um, integral part of the discussion of this transformational um, systemic change. So um, um, that's that's my first uh, comment I want to make. You asked explicitly, then what is the GEF's contribution to it? Here uh, I want to um, uh, maybe share with you two programs we have launched very, very recently within this context of, you know, how to change the food production system and within this um, challenge. First one is food security in Africa. African agriculture is in the perfect storm. 
those three megatrends, increasing population, middle class and urbanization, has been taking place in Africa, while the Africa's agriculture is still very, very difficult um, situation, the low yield and uh, bad soil, and still you know, need to uh, feed the people, and, uh, and the soil degradation, and those things are happening. How we can find or transform this uh, uh, food production system in Africa? So we came up with partners with IFAD, FAO, and others to, um, um, to, to pilot this multi-stakeholder approach, as already mentioned by previous sp speakers, this kind of interconnected issue cannot be solved in silo approach. We need to bring all the stakeholders together under the united value system. So we need to work with the smallholders in Africa, which is the major producer of the food. We need to work with the community. We need to work with the fertilizer company, the seed company. And we need to find a way to for Africa not to exactly follow the mistake maybe Asian Green Revolution made. Uh, too much of uh, over um, fertilizer, that the uh, irrigation, the energy supply. How we can avoid that mistake and uh, still can feed the African population in a sustainable way. So this is one area that then uh, I actually that then uh, uh, um, uh, would like to to really promote and would like to to work with everybody in this room. Second example is supply chain approach. It's already mentioned by previous speaker. Okay, move from. Africa to Latin America, Asia, that 80% of the uh, tropical, forest de tropical forest deforestation came from four global commodities, um, the um, palm oil and the soya and the bees and the paper. So how we can avoid that kind of deforestation while still keeping, you know, that providing good food to consumers. Again, that, the, that we cannot work in isolation. In case of palm oil, we need to create this platform of how to help that smallholders in Indonesia, the Malaysia, now West Africa, to transit from uh, devastating unsustainable farming to a sustainable farming. How we can work with the processors uh, to, uh, um, uh, processing company like Wilma or Karin, or, uh, and how we can work with uh, Unilever or, or the, um, the Nestle. There is already a very good uh, a coalition of, say, uh, responsible suppliers, responsible consumers, like Consumer Goods Forum, and then there are a lot of NGOs and communities working to make sure this supply chain actually are kept under the united value of no, no um, deforestation. But, I, uh, uh, but there are a lot of weakest link here and there. In case of palm oil, in my view, the weakest link is actually the how to help transition of, of smallholders on the ground. And here, our role is to help those, um, um, the capacity building of smallholders to make that transition. But we cannot do it in isolation. Again, that uh, to make sure everybody along that supply chain um, play his or her role is absolutely important. I'm very happy to hear today from uh, <laughs> the Kerob that the consumers are absolutely on board. In case of palm oil, Chinese market, Indian market, not necessarily consumers are on, on board. We still need to make a huge progress to get them on board, to let them understand and share this value of the sustainability. My last point actually is very much inspired by Tommy, that on how we can value of the nature or the ecosystem, how we can realize that value and appropriately to sell to the capital market. Uh, here we are working with, say, uh, some island states and how we can help them issue, for instance, blue bond. It's one way to recognize the blue economy so that uh, we are very much int uh, in, uh, uh, intrigued by this idea of the nation, uh, uh, island states can issue the blue bond so that uh, they can achieve the both to continue this sustainable livelihood, but also leverage the huge financial resources from capital market. This is another example that how the uh, financial institutions like us can create and uh, strengthen this multi the platform. And I hope this is one way for us to contribute that uh, to, to enhance the quality of INDC to implement um, as immediately as possible. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ishii, indeed, for pointing out the importance of uh, taking a more integrated approach. Uh, we know we uh, have food systems that are very unsustainable. Uh, 
from a climate, but also a land degradation from a water, from an energy perspective. But we also know that uh, they are not producing healthy food. Not only do we have 800 million hungry people, we have some 2 billion people lacking uh, vitamins and minerals, and we have some 2 billion people overweight. So yes, we are very impressed by the fact that we have to transform food systems and that it will take many different sectors that haven't worked together before but will have to work more closely together from environment and agriculture and energy all the way to health. So that's a, a major challenge. Uh, we see some, some progress and, and we're sure that you will, uh, through GEF, be making some of those linkages happen. Now, can we move to Tim Grosser, the Minister for Climate Change and Trade Issues of a country that is uh, very much an agricultural country. We've already heard you here on stage earlier, uh, Tim, but uh, you've been involved in this whole climate debate uh, intimately for the last uh, five years and you've seen some changes and uh, we'd like to hear from you what your your outlook is both for New Zealand and, and agriculture here at the COP. Well thank you very much Frank and I think you're absolutely right and I uh, very much agree with your opening remark um, that one can sense a shift. Uh, I have said to, to you earlier and to many other people that I have actually it's been eight years I've been working on this dossier that I have felt I was banging my head against a brick wall on this issue of agriculture and climate change. Now I feel we are starting to be listened to. The action beyond that still needs a great deal of work. So I feel a little more encouraged than where I was when I started on this. And I think it's very interesting to for you to understand why this realisation occurred to a New Zealand minister. First of all, New Zealand is, a, is, a, is an intriguing country in terms of development issues. Most countries, and certainly when I was an economist, you know, uh, believe agriculture is backwardness and industrialisation is the way forward. And of course we consider this completely crude. But one of the consequences of this is that New Zealand structurally is more like a developing country, given the role of agriculture, with the income levels of an advanced economy. So issues that we faced in the first iteration of global action on climate change, namely through the Kyoto Protocol, are, and I've always known this deeply as an article of faith, are the issues that we'll have to confront as we move to a comprehensive deal because it ain't just little New Zealand any longer that has to worry about this. So if we step back and look at the first iteration of global action, what we see is this in the Kyoto framework. And let me just make this clear, this is not anything even approximating a wholesale attack on the Kyoto frameworks. Kyoto frameworks are going to influence deeply and positively any new comprehensive agreement, and the vast bulk of it, I think, will continue to make sense for many, many years to come. But there is a problem on agriculture. So Kyoto, when you strip it down and look at it from a helicopter perspective, is very elegant and very simple. It's identified the six gases, two of which are agriculture, nitrous oxide and methane, and says to Switzerland or New Zealand or whoever it is, the subset of OECD countries that took commitments, you just do one thing. You take responsibility for your emissions and bend the curve downwards. How you, Switzerland, New Zealand, do it, we don't care. Now, for most of these countries, their emissions from agriculture were sufficiently small to allow them to take on the commitment and just ignore their agricultural emissions. I mean, while the United States is not a member of the Kyoto Protocol, Senate threw it out 95 to zero, it nevertheless has shadowed the Kyoto frameworks and is reducing its emissions and tells us about this. But for the United States, the proportion of emissions from agriculture is around 7%. And there are many, many developed countries in that sort of low single digit space. There was, however, one Kyoto Protocol party, New Zealand, which had a fundamental problem. Because year by year, almost exactly 50% of our emissions come from producing food. 
So we take on this commitment to reduce our total emissions. What on earth do you do if 50% of those emissions are from food? Now, given the small size of New Zealand's limited political influence, there's not a hell of a lot we could do about this problem. But I have been saying to the international community, this is no longer an issue, it's just a New Zealand problem. Look at Colombia, 54% of its emissions are producing food. Look at Uruguay, 84% was the last stat I saw, it'll be a bit different now, from food. So you, the international community, are going to have to start to deal with this problem because the paradox of Kyoto is people often used to think when I started talking about this, I'm asking for, to exempt agriculture. But here's the paradox. They exempted agriculture. They did nothing about their agriculture emissions because they did not reflect on the specific characteristics of agriculture and its role in food security. Second point I'd make is there is a very strong statistical correlation between economic efficiency of food production and carbon efficiency. So I don't, we have a rather constrained agricultural sector in terms of diversity. It's just pastoral plus horticulture. Uh, and in pastoral, all the FAO data t will tell you, this is not my propaganda, that New Zealand is easily the most carbon efficient country in the world per kilo of output. And we've been increasing that carbon efficiency by over 1% every year for the last 30 years. Now, what we did as a practical matter was everyone else was focusing on what were their priority emissions, which is basically decarbonizing the energy sector, which is the number one requirement. We then realized nobody was paying any attention to agriculture. So we established, I proposed at Poznan, my first COP in 2008, the creation of a global research alliance, which is a virtual new organization of agricultural scientists, to try to find technologies that would allow us to meet the objective that we other pre previous speakers have talked about, 70% more food, while dealing with the reality that agriculture food production is 14%, 14% of emissions, and can't just be ignored. And um, I haven't got the time to go into it, but the big takeaway is this. We shouldn't be surprised that scientists have made incredible progress. If you think about the last 150 years, we've asked you know, Japanese agricultural scientists, New Zealand scientists, American scientists, to focus on increasing productivity. No one ever asked them to focus on emissions. And the upshot of this is looking at Livestock, which is our prior prime need because enteric methane is one-third of our total emissions. And it's, by the way, on a global level, it is 5% of global emissions. And I don't think the solution on this, Frank, is to encourage everyone to become vegans. It's not going to work. So we have made huge progress towards identifying a range of technology. I'm happy to discuss this at some other time in greater depth. And most intriguingly, just my final comment, to our, I think, great surprise. We found that the mi microbial organisms inside the rumen of livestock has almost exactly the same characteristics, whether you're talking about alpacas or buffaloes. So we organized 140 scientists from 74 countries or international organizations to do a census on this and found that there are no important differences whatsoever. What this means, Frank, is that if we can eventually move out of the laboratory and field trials into spreading these technologies, we won't have to customize it. And so we're making progress, but we've got a long pathway ahead. Thank you, and thank you for being a leader in New Zealand in uh, looking for ways where we can reduce uh, mitigation from agriculture. Of course, uh, that plea does uh, make me want to repeat for a moment that we in the CGIR are worried about that, but also about the fate of the 500 million smallholders who are not really, uh, I think, the key part of the problem, but are definitely uh, the ones at the sharp end of, uh, of the impacts. And while I think uh, the, uh, the economy of uh, New Zealand might have a developing country structure, your farmers have a better capacity to adapt. 
and indeed it is the very low capacity to adapt from smallholder farmers uh, in developing countries that we, I think, need to combine. Uh, and that we're hoping to see more breakthroughs on. We'll hope to see uh, unlocking some climate finance. I think, uh, Dr. Rishi, you have given us some uh, indication that that might be on the, the forefront. And we've had here a number of different stakeholders who will all have to work together uh, very hard to, to, to see that double or, or even triple win of having uh, increased food security with low carbon uh, uh, agriculture and uh, better uh, agroecology, better environmental functioning as well to stay away from planetary boundaries. Now, we've had here uh, four leaders uh, share their thoughts with you. This was a very short session. We don't have an opportunity for questions. We did stop uh, just on time. So I would like to thank you all for your willingness to be here and uh, for your insights during this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Frank. That was within seconds on time. Could the, um, could the uh, folks on the next panel please uh, come and join me on the podium? That is Sithembile, Philippe, and uh, Sophia. Okay. Okay. You guys have a seat. Yeah, thanks. Where's Sophia? Okay. All right. So <coughs> we wanted in this last forty-five minutes to uh, to talk about people. Um, just in case the previous sessions we didn't talk about that so much, but actually they, we did, which is great. But it's still good to talk about uh, some of the socioeconomic challenges around all this, uh, which include gender, um, but also youth and, uh, and other issues. So we thought we'd have a somewhat of a practitioner level discussion um, about to what extent the INDCs and all this huge effort around agriculture, um, to what extent this is blind or not blind to some of the major political and socioeconomic challenges that are out there. Um, great, you're here. Welcome, Agrippa. <laughs> right on time. Okay, um, so let me briefly introduce the panel. The panel, we have uh, Sith Embile, um, who is the, the project manager uh, for food, agriculture, and natural resources at FANPRAN. Uh, so she coordinates their work on youth and, and gender. And, uh, and, and FANPRAN are doing some great work on this. We have uh, Philippe. Um, uh, Levesque, who is Executive Director of Care France uh, after a long and distinguished career in, in care, but also uh, beginning his career in IBM. Um, we have um, Agrippa Jenkins, uh, who is uh, uh, replacing your, your, your colleague uh, Giovanna Valverde, who's been called off in negotiations. And Agrippa is uh, an expert from the Ministry of Agriculture on NAMAS and NAPAS, so we're looking forward to hearing uh, more about that. And uh, we have uh, Sophia uh, Huye, is, who is the uh, uh, CGIR specialist on, 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 this, on this subject. So um, why don't, rather than me firing off questions to the panel, we start with, with a bit of uh, uh, questions from yourselves. Um, what would you like to hear about from this panel? Um, or any comments so far on the discussion, specifically on um, gender, um, but also on youth and other socioeconomic issues. To what extent is this featuring or not? What are your questions or concerns about it? Who wants to lead off? Please, Natasha. Thank you, um, Natasha Griss from uh, Overseas Development Institute. Um, I work on climate smart agriculture primarily in developing programs and strategies um, in East and Southern Africa. 
Um, but looking more broadly across Climate Smart Ag, what I can see from the gender and social inclusion area is that that's coming up as a topic and people are including it in some of the projects and programs. What I'm not really seeing is a, a coherent approach to this in terms of integrating um, aspects of gender, poor, vulnerable, marginalised, elderly and youth. And I'm wondering if um, there is a space to really develop a more structured approach to this and, and how you think that would be. Thank you. Natasha, just to, because you're somewhat of a specialist on all this too, I mean, where do you see, where do you see it missing, where, uh, where you would expect to see it in an ideal world? Mm. Where is it absent? Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I work with quite a lot of NGOs, um, but from a kind of research technical perspective in developing programs, um, and I think what I can see is that some of the NGOs are really leading on this and absolutely fantastic in um, designing, explaining, and then coming to the forefront and talking to people about these issues. But what I'm not really seeing is this being fully integrated into larger scale programs and major funding initiatives. And I think CCAFs is doing some great work in taking this up in terms of some of the research. But I, I still feel that it's quite at the beginning and there's a lot more that's needed to be done in terms of looking at what really happens, measuring particularly in Africa where women farmers are so predominant, um, looking at impacts that are um, potential from a much better, more targeted investment. Thank you. So still something of a checkbox on the periphery compared to where it should be. If I understand correctly, please, this gentleman. Thank you. I'm uh, Oladili from South Africa. Mm, my worry about the gender issue in climate has been that with climate change, they treated like any other innovation in agriculture. Women lack the assets, the capitals, for them to have a meaningful livelihood. And these are precluding them, excluding them from certain things. Because if you don't have land, why do I introduce you to a new variety where you need land? Or why do I introduce you to fertilizer that you will use to support what you are growing on your land? So it's a vicious circle. Now, women are predominant. Climate change has come in as one of those issues. The antecedents of the exclusions for women, they are still there. Are we changing it? Or what are we doing to make it change in order for a greater impact of climate change not to be heavier on women than men? Look at the different sources of communication. And in one of the researches uh, we did in the university, we use extension officers as contact. We use the ICT. But you, we, we, we found that it was only when messages are through face to face, that's when cultural barrier, human restriction, women elimination comes in. When you use ICT, you use these that are gender sensitive, gender neutral. The exclusion, the degree of exclusion is lower compared with when we use face to face person. Are we still going to carry climate smart solutions or information through face to face and still continue with the exclusion? Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, the uh, the uh, lady at the back there. Thank you. My name is Andrea. I'm from Peru, and I work in collaboration with Ashenica and Yineyami peoples in the Peruvian Amazon. I would like to transmit one question that I was asked by Ashenica woman in Ucayali to the panel, to the panelists. Um, so we, she, she approached me and she asked me, "How can I do?" to communicate to these people that have a concession, a logging concession in my territory, when these big machines that are going to open their ways in order to extract wood cross my patio 
in my patio, I'm growing palms that I need to build my roof. The palms are far and far, farther and farther, and it's more uh, difficult for me to get the palms to change my roof that I need to change every certain time. So when I, I told to the people that is driving these big trucks, they told me, you are an ignorant person. You don't know that there is so many palms. But she's concerned, and um, she asked me, what can I do? These are not illegal logging. These are very legal logging concessions given by the government. Uh, well, I would like to transmit that question that I was asked to the panelists. Thank okay. you. And probably not an unusual situation. Um, any other uh, comments or questions? I'll bring in the panel on these and other things. Okay, let me, let me bring in uh, our experts on this. Um, I... Uh, there was a question about, I think there was a common question about why is this issue not really breaking through? And I guess some frustrations that it, it's sort of there, but a bit like agriculture and negotiations, it's making advances, but it's not quite there. I wonder if, Sophia, you could say a bit about to what extent this featured in the INDCs. What's the evidence base? Is there an evidence base to support the hypothesis that the issue is still somewhat uh, on the margins, at least on paper? Yes, uh, the short answer is yes, there is. Um, I think uh, many of us are aware that the issue of gender has been receiving much greater attention and there's much greater recognition that gender issues and women's issues need to be taken into account. But I think you know the questions here um, so far and um, our analysis of the INDCs indicate that it's still very much um, uh, not as well integrated at the integral, at the practical level, and, and where change is taking place. Um, for example, in the INDCs, uh, we found that gender or women are mentioned. Um, we did this analysis at um, 160 uh, INDC plans submitted, so I think there have been more since. But from our analysis, just over 40% of the INDCs mention gender at all. And these were, interestingly, primarily from the developing countries. So that's a different issue again. Why, why is this less uh, mentioned in the North? But that's um, an editorial question at this point. Um, but the references were very, again, um, no, I won't say superficial, but just in terms of reference. It's important to support women. Um, what will the impacts on women be? Women are the most vulnerable populations. But there was very little in terms of practical, adapt, um, uh, practical planning, practical um, activities with women, and, and less recognition that women are active, actively dealing with, they are active in their communities, they are active in their households, they are active in agriculture, and there's still not a lot of recognition of that role that women play and the capacities they have in terms of their knowledge and their experience in recovering from um, climate change and in developing adaptation um, strategies to adapt to climate change. Um, and you know, we know from experience and from research that climate change technologies and practices are actually adapted more technology when they understand these issues. When women are um, brought into the decision making and choice around the technologies and practices and when women's activities, their priorities and their um, roles are taken into account in how those technologies are developed. Okay, that's very clear. So it's not really featuring as much as you would hope, and uh, and if it's not it part of the implementation, we've got problems. I wonder if I could bring in uh, uh, Agrippa to say a bit about, I mean, I don't know, Agrippa, to what extent you're involved in the INDC, um, but maybe you could say something about, you know, what you've seen from the policy discussions that you've been involved in, in creating these climate plans, whether the role of gender has featured, if not, why not, and perhaps something about the implementation of all this. Uh, so please, go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm a little bit lost with time, actually, but uh, thank to everybody to be here. Um, we'd like to express a little bit regarding this subject, the theme, regarding Costa Rica's perspective. So right now we have two NAMAs, one is coffee and the other one is from livestock for the agriculture sector. 
And regarding, for example, we have in our policy in agriculture, there is a pillar that is dedicated for youth regarding uh, one of the questions. Because for us, saying in the implementation part, we haven't seen a change in the generation. A lot of our youth is going to the city. They don't want to stay and produce at the farms of their parents. But regarding gender, um, I can tell you about our experience. We have a hundred farms in li the ni livestock NAMA, where you can see that for every capacity building, it goes the husband and the wife. And that for us was really interesting because you can see the dynamic. We were making some progress regarding economic indicators and rega um, selecting information from them so we can have indicators for the whole farm not only for the family, and we make a little bit of research regarding gender. And also, it was interesting to see how um, they say the farm belongs to the husband, but the one that is taking all the information that knows what's going on and taking most of the decisions is the wife, which was really interesting to see re regarding recollecting um, information. But yeah, if you go to our um, general information, you can see that land does not belong to a lot of women, that um, we don't have a lot of um, what we call ganaderas. There are really, really few. And it, it takes uh, a different approach. And even inside the ministry, to take the technicians, which is interesting because most of the time I'm the only woman sitting there, to let them know that they need to take gender into consideration regarding technologies, regarding capacity building, and regarding policies. It's really interesting. So that's a little bit of what I can tell you. And I don't know if there is more. We can go back to that. Thank you, Thank you so much. And perhaps I can just add um, you know, my current role in the GEF. Uh, uh, from, uh, we're trying to really deepen the attention to gender uh, in all these environment projects that we receive and fund. And uh, we did some research uh, a year or two back and found that in many, many cases, there's just simply no mention of the, so not just gender, the whole socioeconomic dimension. And I think that's part of the segmentation of issues that, that we're, we're, we're facing is where you have these excellent technicians who are trained and specialists in soil science or something else, kind of leading projects that actually require a whole set of skills that it's quite hard to expect any one person to put together. And, um, and, and maybe, you know, that, that technically led process that we're seeing on climate and elsewhere is, 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 is part of the problem. And, and so we're really trying to use the GEF as a, one of the principal funding mechanisms of the so-called environment projects to really try and leverage much greater attention. But anyway, let me hear more from the panel. Um, uh, Philippe, what's, what's your sense of why this issue is not breaking through in negotiations or, or elsewhere. What's going on here? Well, you, you just said it. It's a boys' discussion. The, the discussion on climate change came from a technical environmental dimension, which is highly technical, mathematics, science, etc. And that's where it is a boys' discussion. So indeed, there are mostly men. I'm happy to be with you, ladies. There are mostly men around the table in negotiation. That's very clear. So it's a man thing. Second, it's a political thing. And we have to go back to politics. Women farmers make very nice photos. Very nice. You see them all over the place. But as a gentleman from South Africa said, they do not own the assets. They do not vote. You've seen the family photo of all the uh, head of states in Paris last week, how many women amongst them? Mostly men. How many of them care about their population? So there is a link between democracy, whatever the definition of democracy is, obviously, I'm not judging there, and climate change and poverty reduction, etc. It's all linked. Half of the head of states who were there don't care about their population. Now, why should they care about poor farmers who do not vote? And amongst them, for poor women with no assets married to poor farmers. So we have, and not to mention uh, indigenous people. 
So we have a link there that is very difficult to break. And for an NGO like CARE, like mine, we put the question of women's rights at the center of what we do, but it's because we do see this double injustice that they're facing. Injustice from climate change and injustice from gender inequality. I don't think there'll be much progress this week. You know, in all this, I've been to several of these negotiations. The first uh, week, uh, number one, the first week of the negotiation is about, you know, uh, making an agreement, saving the agreement. The week number two, which we're entering now, is about saving the COP. There has to be an agreement, whatever the agreement, but it has to be an agreement. So I think it will be a weak agreement, but I think we'll be lucky uh, because it's not a given, we'll be lucky if we manage to have the words, only the words, of food security, not in brackets, but in the activable part of the discussion of the treaty, and the word uh, maybe, maybe gender equality, but at least the question of human rights and gender. It's not there yet. Many governments are wants to stop it, as you know. And the last thing I wanted to do is, uh, being a French person, is the question of language. All these negotiations are in English. It's very difficult for not native uh, English speakers in the delegations to contribute significantly, whether they come from a Spanish environment, or Spanish speaking environment, or French speaking environment, or whatever. It's very hard, so it has an impact. And as we heard this morning, many of the contributions came at the last minute. Then I guess how they do it. You know, the prime minister, the head of state is coming to Paris French diplomacy has been very active. They call on the president and say, we haven't received your contribution. We need to have it tomorrow. If not, it's name and shame. So they call on the technicians, younger people in their 20s, midnight, 1 a.m., in their air-conditioned or non-air-conditioned office, trying to pick up something. And they look like any student. And that's what we get then. They go on the internet and say, take an average francophone country. They will look at the next biggest a uh, fran francophone country, copy and paste the national contribution. So of course it's top down. No wonder nobody's contributing at the farmers organization, etc. And if the country next door hasn't been able to produce something, then we go to an equivalent anglophone countries and copy and paste and translate. That's what you get. Wow, thank you, Philippe. That was well. That's life. That, that was really interesting. I mean, do do um, and it, I guess uh, Sophia, it's uh, and then I'll bring in Sifembele. But in terms of what you saw on the text, I mean, was there any? Because uh, I haven't gone through all these INDCs. I mean, was there any any of them that kind of unpicked, for example, in agriculture that gender is really important and land tenure issues are a really important part of solving this problem, was there any of that depth or, or were they more sort of higher level not really touching that? They were, they were mostly, the yeah, no, they were mostly fairly high level. Um, there were 10 references to women as farmers or in agriculture, so 10 countries only even mentioned it, even mentioned it. Um, some countries did talk about the importance of ensuring that women and women farmers and other groups um, were involved in capacity development and were involved in support uh, for agriculture. But um, the one thing to say about the gender references is that they were primi primarily about non-agricultural subjects. So that's also an important omission in the INDCs, considering women's role in ag agriculture in most of the world, which is at 43% as a global average, but in some of the least developing countries, you know, 60, 70, 80%. Um, there, are, there are two countries either have or have made reference to a gender and climate change action plan. And that's Liberia, who, which has developed one, and Peru apparently is in the process of developing one. And I think that's really a positive uh, model, but um, obviously it needs to be um, spread. M many parties are talking about you know, the climate change policy being set in the context of the national gender policy or the national poverty strategy, uh, but it's all quite high level. Thank you, Sophie. Um, Seth Embley, we've spoken about gender, and I'd be love to hear from you on that, but, but also I know you're working closely on, on youth issues, so it's another hugely important area. I mean, tell us a bit more about how you'd like to see in your dreams that featuring in this whole discussion. 
Well, when it comes to youth issues, we're saying that there's only 40% of mention of, of gender. There's even less mm -hmm. for youth. In, and the youth issues are lumped under poverty reduction and you know, socioeconomic issues. So it's not standing out clearly. Only about 15 countries have mentioned youth as a um, key component. And of those, it's eight African countries that actually spell out the need to strengthen the adaptive capacity of, of young people. And I think it's mostly because of the challenge that, especially in Africa, most of these countries are facing with uh, high levels of unemployment and more young people coming into the into the employment area. So really, um, for instance, for, for Nigeria, it talks of um, diversifying the economy so that it creates more green jobs. So it's really about governments covering their backs so that you don't have a lot of unemployed young people who then, you know, become the people that cause problems in the end. But it's interesting for, for Zambia, it specifically talks about um, developing um, sustainable agriculture and uh, implementing programs around conservation agriculture and climate smart agriculture and how you can bring young people in, into that. Uh, so there is some hope for some countries and we hope that those that have not included youth and gender issues can take um, an exam a page from, from those countries. But what I think the, the challenge really is about, it's about not including young people in the discussions. Yes, the INDCs were submitted at the last minute, but there was a whole year before where people had an opportunity to consult. Young people, they are creative. They've got ideas. When they don't have jobs, they go out and you know create opportunities for themselves. So it's important that as we are coming up with these INDCs, with plans of how we're going to, uh, to go forward, we engage them to say, what do they want to see in these plans? They have brilliant ideas, and they can, they can actually help countries in framing some of these, um, these INDCs and some of these plans that are out there. So it's really about involvement. But I'll also like to touch on my colleague from South Africa who talked about the issue of communication. That's another big, big challenge, you know? We usually talk science to people that don't understand the scientific, the technical terms. There's need to distill some of these scientific um, issues in a language that even the farmers at community level can, can understand. Community radios are out there, you have theater, you have, for young people, you have social media. So it's important that as we communicate, we target our audiences and we use the right mediums for the different audiences. Thank you, Suzanne Billy. I mean, I would, uh, I would love to hear more from the audience about whether anyone disagrees with what appears to be a consensus view that for, uh, for the reasons I think uh, Philippe and others put very clearly, this issue is, is strikingly missing from much of the discussions around climate change and, uh, and, uh, and for the reasons that we discussed. So I'd be interested in anyone actually disagrees with that. Um, but then any questions or views about what on earth you can do to try and broaden this discussion and have a much more holistic approach to the issue? So who would like to say something? Please. Well, hello, my name is Camille and I'm from the Free University of Amsterdam. Um, so actually my question is, one of the questions is actually why, why is this piece missing? Um, and I've been listening to a lot of panel discussions and going through the booths today, and we're talking about gender equality, including women in the discussion, including youth in the discussion. But then my question is, but we don't know where they are. We don't know the communities. If we go to uh, the countries like, for example, Indonesia, we don't know who the farmers are. We don't know their age. We, there is no mapping of, of communities, no big scale, large scale knowing uh, where are smallholder farmers, what, are, what is their background, what is their um, uh, socioeconomic situation. So how, how, can we, how can we change this and how can we map and, and get a clear view on how communities are, where the people are and who they are, so that then we can actually point out to something visual, like here they are, and then include them in the discussion. Thank you, thanks, that's very clear. Any other uh, comments or questions on this? Anyone actually disagree? 
just to be uh, provocative, to get the discussion going? Or do we all agree with each other? Great. <laughs> Please disagree. Sorry to disappoint you. I'm not disagreeing. I just want to make a comment. My name is Achua Eno from the Secretariat of the Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture. I just want to give my own view as to why some of these very crucial elements from the grassroots are not included in the IMBCs. It's in the very nature that these IMBCs were developed. Like it was clearly pointed out, they come up through the window or out of the window as a last minute process. Why does this happen? In my view, I think the problem is at the level of how this whole process of developing the indices is initiated, how it is handled, how it is managed. If the UNFCCC in, uh, initiative is serious about getting INDCs with a bottom-up, with a grassroots input, with, from a bottom-up approach, the process needs to be monitored. A roadmap needs to be developed and, and a monitoring process put in place to check the various countries that from this, at this time in the year, we expect a preliminary report that indicates X, Y, Z. At point B in the year, we need an update of the report that indicates one, two, three. If there is a roadmap in building up the INDCs with a monitoring process, proper processes, proper national consultations will be carried out and you will get the INDCs reflecting what the people fo feel on the ground, not something that is just thumbsucked at the last minute. Thank you. Thank you. And can I just ask you, actually, do, I mean, you sound familiar with this. I mean, is there any clarity on, on what happens to these INDCs after this? Are they going to evolve? Are they going to be revised and revisited at what point? Or is that all still for the negotiating discussions? Well, unfortunately, I can't answer that because I'm not part of the negotiations. But from what I hear, it's like, OK, now this is a commitment. And the next step is next year at COP22, see where we are with those commitments. Whether there will be a monitoring system, a monitoring process between now and COP22, I have no idea. Thank you. Um, any other comments or questions? Hi, I'm Simone from University of Copenhagen. Um, I've been working with the INDCs uh, on agricultural adaptation. And we also looked a little bit at the gender issue, but we didn't find so many adaptation measures that specifically were on gender. So I wondered if you could identify some measures that would have been nice to include so gender would have a fair uh, representation in the INDCs. Thank you. It's also very clear. Um, why don't we, uh, okay, one more and then we turn to the panel. Um, hello, I'm Lee Kwan Jo from Zimbabwe. Uh, we just touched really quickly on the issue of youth and I just wanted to ask what exactly is being done or can be done to involve youth in uh, farming and like sustainable future for within agriculture. Because often you youth gain the mindset that, uh, or we see the bright lights and see that's where the future is. But I want to ask if anything's really being done to involve us in getting more into agriculture and sustainable agriculture. Great question, and if I can add, when I was in IFAD, that was a huge worry of many of my colleagues, is who are the next generation of farmers? Because it wasn't part of the aspiration set of many of the communities we worked, and, 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 and that, that's a real risk to overall food supplies too. Um, let me uh, turn to the panel. Who would like to uh, come in on any of those questions or comments? <coughs> Please. Let me answer the, the last question. On, on youth, we are having this discussion here. The youth are having their own discussion in the next room. And I think that's probably one of the, the biggest challenges to say, we, we want to involve young people in agriculture, but we want them to have their own conversation on their own. Yet we are the people that at this moment are making the decisions. We are the people that have the money that can help the youth with um, actually actualizing some of the projects that they have. There are many examples of good projects that have been going on on engaging youth in agriculture. For instance, um, the Junior Life Schools program that FAO runs 
it has done a lot to actually develop the skills of young people in agriculture. And we also have examples of young people that have taken the initiative themselves. We have the Kulima young farmers from, from Kenya that have seen that they can't access finance because they don't have you know, anything to give the banks as assurance. So what they have done is they have started connecting amongst themselves as young people. Um, giving out information of where they can get funds, giving out information of where they can get better seeds for their production. So there are many cases of how young people can get involved. You talked about IFAD. IFAD has also been doing a lot of, of, of work in trying to get young people engaged. There is a global network of uh, young professionals in agriculture and rural development, YPAD, that's also doing a lot to connect. So it's really about the information being out there for young people to access and to know about existing opportunities. And I think that's what we need to do, to just showcase what's out there for young people to tap into. Thank you, thank you. Others, there was a question about the evidence base for all this. I think in terms of knowing what's going on in the communities and all the data, quantitative, quantitative and qualitative data, whenever there's any kind of intervention support, but more broadly, <coughs> you know, what's the problem here? To what extent will these INDCs fail if this issue is overlooked? And uh, I wonder, if Sophia, if you can say a bit about whether we've got all that evidence and if we do, again, is the problem one of communication or is the one of not really having enough of a, an evidence base to us to be able to make this argument, please? Certainly there's an evidence, evidence base out there. Um, uh, speaking from the perspective of CGIR and CCAFs, there's definitely an evidence base. Um, we're in the process of compiling one uh, through the gender household survey that's being undertaken in a number of countries in three developing regions on not just gender, but um, ethnicity, who the smallholder farmers are, what are the differential access to resources and assets, what are the differential perspectives on climate change. It's, it's a small evidence base, but it is developing, so that is coming out. I think the problem is not what do we need more information, we need more evidence. We need more um, examples of what works and what models are effective. We do know the CJR takes um, a, a position that there are three um, main pillars of ensuring that women uh, and other social groups benefit and can actively participate in climate change adaptation and mitigation. And those are um, that women have access and control of resources for agricultural production. And so that I'd like to comment a bit on the ICT um, comment that is, um, in general, a good technology for reaching farmers, including women farmers, and for reaching youth. However, what we find with women is that they don't control the technology. They don't own the mobile phones. Um, they have to request access or borrow access from family members or rent access from the mobile kiosks. Um, in fact, the best ICT for women is radio. And, and because it's a household, it's in the household, it's uh, more generally available, and women can listen to it while they're doing, while they're doing work. So the issue here is, is, not, is very important to give women access. So we have, some we have evidence that once women have information on climate smart agricultural practices, they use them, they improve productivity, they increase their incomes, and they adopt them very successfully. Uh, but when women don't have control over the access, uh, uh, control over the resources, or participate in the decision making about how those resources are used and what is done with the proceeds, then we don't have very much progress. So those are some of the two main issues that we're looking for. And so just to answer the question about what could we include in the INDCs, to, I would say you know that women's role needs to be recognized and supported in terms of capacity development, access to resources, services that support them, um, and not just women. There needs to be that understanding that there needs to be gender um, equity and access, equality among different groups and different ages. Thank you. Can I just add uh, my experience in the Jeff? I mean, I think um, the Jeff is trying very hard to move from a situation, and I'm over-characterizing this, right? 
there have been exa worst case examples of projects in the past where you have male technicians uh, working with male government officials to put together projects um, and without really thinking about this issue. And the gender dimension was really pushed as a safeguards issue, so a risk minimization issue. So some box has to be ticked somewhere along the project design that says you thought about these issues. So it's entirely seen as a sort of a negative filter. Well, we're trying to turn that conversation around and say, if you want these cook stoves that we're rolling out to be adopted and to work, you've got to recognize the socioeconomics of where you're working and that you've got to consult with the main users, which in most cases are women. So see it as an opportunity rather than a traditional safeguards risk. And that's the way many of the development banks had originally entered this issue. Once you're stuck there, you're always, in, to some extent, seen as checkbox. Uh, anyway, just to share that, 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 that perspective. Uh, anyone else like to say anything on, on the comments so far? Please. I'd like to say uh, about how we did our INDC regarding the question that the colleague made about the bottom-up approach. Actually, for uh, regarding the INDC with the part of agriculture, we made consultations with the chambers and producers that were invited to first of all let them know what uh, the INDC will apply for them, what may be consequences or what they think about that. Because most of the time what we get uh, from the chambers of producers from um, sugar, uh, beef and all of their s milk as well, is that well, uh, we are on board, but if we're gonna produce, right? They're not gonna tell us in five years, you gotta stop producing and we're gonna leave out of the air. So we have like, no, we're four actually, that we're in touch and then we have a national one where we expose and have um, round tables regarding that. So our INDC was constructed a little bit different, yes, in a short period of time, but at least we have the chambers in the private sector because one thing that we learned is that if you do process without taking care, not only the socially, of course, part, but also the private one, it's going to apply it because people sometimes think that private is an enterprise. Do not think that it's the farm, it's the farmer that is going to apply the technologies. So we tried to do that. It was, it was part of our process. Thank you. Um, we have time for a quick last round of comments or questions, and then we need to wind up. So um, we're still a little stuck on this dilemma that this is really important. We don't quite know how to change things as fast as we need to uh, in terms of uh, sensitizing us all to this issue. So any, anyone can help us fix this, please. Hi, um, I know you're gonna hate me for saying this, but actually, one group that has done a lot of effort in reaching to women is the private sector. Good or bad, but in terms of marketing and reaching to female consumers, there's been a lot of change in the past 10 years uh, in terms of thinking about which products and how we access this base of consumer. And I think there could be a lot to be learned from a private sector. Of course, a lot of smallholders are not consumers in a traditional sense, but in terms of techniques and know-how, um, for once, the private sector might have been slightly ahead of this for, of course, uh, the purpose of making money, but I don't think it's a bad motivation. So I would urge, you know, in that conversation about gender, if you are just institutions, you're also missing out on a lot of knowledge that's happening uh, in terms of how we reach to these female groups that have been excluded in the past. Thank you, could you introduce yourself? Sorry, sorry my name is Isabel Koch. I'm with the International Agri-Food Network, which is a private sector uh, federation of groups. But um, it's a bit of a personal comment. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. This gentleman over there. Thank you very much. My name is Olu Ajayi, and I work with CTA based in the Netherlands. It seems to me that this is a very important thing, but um, we, we seem to be addressing the symptom rather than the root causes. We talk of why women are not, re are not represented and the youth. But we need to take a step backward and look at what are the fundamental issues. The level of education. If, if, if you have all the time to consult all the ministries, who will be sitting and representing those ministries? Most likely men. So I think we need to uh, take a step back and look at more fundamental issues that this is just one of the things that's just a kind of a symptom. I can imagine beyond climate change, if you want to talk of other issues on development, 
apart from climate change, you still find the same issue that women are less represented, the youth are, are less represented. So I think it's, 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 a, it's a bigger issue beyond just climate change. Let's look at the bigger picture and the fundamental issues underlying this problem. Thank you. Great point. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? So let me, uh, let me turn just any final words from the panel. But um, I think this seems to have come back to a place where the wise words, are, I think, that, that you've all spoken are that uh, you can't really fix the climate problem without addressing all the other developmental problems that hold us back in so many different ways. And that's why it's so damn difficult and complicated. Um, and if you try and hide from that complexity, well, we'll probably fail on, on many things. But um, who would I'll, do you want to uh, say a few words uh, in closing? And then I'll turn to uh, Michael to wind up. Well, of course, there is no uh, easy solution. Uh, someone this morning said there has to be bruises in the discussions. Well, there, there are, obviously. And yes, we need to tackle the root causes of poverty and, and injustice. And that's part of the process. Many of the solutions were said in this room, so I think the people here should be at the negotiation table because we know what to do, we know what to do. So it's a question of political will. Uh, we know that we need data and science and having access to data is very expensive, but I'm sure that technical progress will help us to visualize the situation, to map. We know that we need to work on the rights of, of, of women. You know, many of the uh, microfinance programs, you know it or you might not know it, are coming to um, are, are being stopped now are facing difficulties because this is these women who are in their 60s or 70s now who have been doing great microfinance they're dying and then the younger generation see that the assets of these women are being taken by the brother-in-law or the family so why the hell should they uh, you know work like hell and then they cannot keep these assets or transmit them to their children so all these fundamental rights have to be uh, issued and uh, have to be addressed. But we know it. We know it. Another big flaw in all the discussion is that within the question of women and of their rights, as a vehicle to an end, we use the women because maybe we need to check the box, or maybe they do the actual work on the ground. So they are a vehicle to an end to achieve better productivity. They are not an end in itself in themselves. So we don't do it on moral ground because we must have gender equality. But we do it because we hope that we tick the box and get something. So, of course, it doesn't work. And my final comment is that it is therefore very important to see what will happen next, to answer the gentleman's comment, the mechanism of the ambition, what is called the mechanism of the ambition. So what is going to happen over the past five to ten years? How we, do we have a binding agreement or not? Can we monitor and do governments accept the monitoring or not? And then how can we make them accountable of what they've signed in Paris? But to make them accountable, we need to have these words, the youth, gender equality, human rights, food security, not only food distribution and production, in the binding agreement. If not, we, as activists, as NGOs, as scientists, we do not have the technical and legal instruments that will help us at CARE or at uh, all the other NGOs do our work. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, closing thoughts from colleagues, please? For me, I think uh, my closing thought is that don't lump the issues. Don't lump gender and youth issues under social inequality issues. They need to, to stand out and stand alone. And I think with the years, we have just seen a, a growing um, global movement of young people that are concerned about uh, climate change issues, young people that want to see a future world, you know, that is, um, that, that, that is, is good, good for them. So the main issue is all these things that we are talking about here, they can only happen if we have an enabling environment. And that has a lot to do with the kind of policies that we we have in place with the kind of infrastructure that we have in place. So we need to, to clean our houses and make sure that we, we create an enabling environment for women and for youth as well to be able to participate. Thank you so much, Thembla. Actually, Philip, just thinking back to what you just said, there's something of an analogy in the debate I, I, I'm seeing uh, between you know, the protected areas logic on environment and uh, the green economy logic with the rights-based approach to gender and the economic efficiency case for gender. 
in terms of how you convince people. And I think we could have another longer discussion, we've just run out of time to have it, about how we can persuade uh, or whether we can just mandate our attention to this issue. Uh, and I think that, that deserves unpicking, but we don't have time to unpick it, so sorry. But thanks for raising it. Um, any other closing thoughts, or shall I turn to Michelle? Please, so Sophia. If I could just follow up on your comment. Um, I think uh, you know climate change impacts have the potential to have huge social effects. And they have the impact to really increase the global gender gap, widen the gender gap. So I think um, you know, this silo problem is one of our main problems. Um, that, as Philippe mentioned, it's a lot of technocrat um, activity, technocrat working together, copying of text, when really there needs to be a much wider integration and understanding of what the socioeconomic issues are. So around gender e equality, it's good to have um, all of the UNFCC entities be encouraged to have a greater gender balance. That's a good start. But if, we're, if the UNFCC is not making the socioeconomic um, issues a priority, in